in meals, uh, breakfast processing, uh, flour meals, all of them different processing. So the problem can exist here, the insect problem. And from where after processing is stored in warehouses. So a lot of the insect problem occurs in warehouses. From there it goes to the grocery store to sell it. And of course, problem insect damage can occur in grocery store. And then final stage is it comes to your kitchen. And then sometimes you might find moths flying out of your kitchen or beetles crawling, right? So it's can happen in the pantry too. So, so my area here, I want to talk about is just how we can uh, actually integrate different types of uh, strategies to manage insects. So most of the concept we I'm talking about is like I'm going to individually talk about these uh, different kinds of management. But how can we integrate different components together to make a durable and sustainable management? And here we are talking about management. It is not control. Control means you are completely eradicating. That's not our objective. But we want to maintain below an economic threshold so the damage could be managed. So uh, the work in the past uh, I'm going to talk about is like the different types of talk, uh, the treatments, starting from heat treatment. I'm not sure anybody heard of heat treatments. Yes? Okay. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about thermal based main disruption, which is uh, one of the phenomena we try, and also some of the CEO chemicals that is the attractors for mass traffic. And now some uh, currently going on work with ozone treatment. And anybody heard of ozone? So using uh, ozone in here in Portugal? Yes. No. Yes. yes? Okay, good. I don't know if it is used for storage. No, no, no. Okay. okay. But for a near port, under the wireless and. Ah, yes. It is used for sterilized for this disinfectant. Yes, it is a very good disinfectant. The uh, water purification system from wine industry that's very good. Yeah. So, uh, so you could be getting some of those. So, starting with, I want to talk a little bit about the area of temperature uh, or heat treatment to manage insects. So this is basically, I want to uh, clarify, when I talk about heat treatment, I'm not talking, there are two types of heat treatment. One is the structural treatment, to treat the structures like uh, flower mills, feed mills, or warehouses. The other one is the product treatment. And I'm not going to cover about the product treatment, I'm just going to cover about the structural treatment. So what it means is, it is actually a very old technology, it's not a thing, because the, the structural treatment up the structure of any facility, a flour mill, a feed mill, a breakfast processing plant, up to 50 to 60 degrees Celsius and maintain that temperature for 24 to 36 hours. So it's like a prolonged maintenance to kill all the insects. So this was a very old technology. You can see that in the literature it says first recorded in 1835, but actually heat treatment gave some problem at that time. Mainly because uh, in the United States the mills were built with wood. And when they heated the, the mills, what happened is the wood walk, right? And expand and walk and shrink. So it was a problem really for the uh, United States at that time to use this technology. So what happens is the technology was abandoned in 1915, more or less, uh, because of this problem. But then the miracle few in the came, everybody aware of the Roman. It's one of the best we had. So when metal bromide came, every, everyone started to use metal bromide for disinfestation of the milk. So, but what happened is metal bromide has so much problem, right? So it's damaging the ozone layer, so it was phased out in almost all the developing countries, and sorry, developed countries, and developing countries have permission until few more years to use it until they get their alternatives. So uh, now in the United States also So they really respond to the uh, temperature change, which help us to use this treatment. And this is a uh, product uh, from Paul Fields in Canada, who really did a beginning in an annual review of technology showing the responses of insects happening uh, in the temperature changes. And you could see either cases, either very low temperatures or very high temperatures, we can kill the insects in minutes. And if this is the concept we use the treatment for product treatment. 
So it is the young girl is the most uh, difficult one to kill. So if you are doing any kind of heat treatment, we need to gauge the effectiveness of heat treatment. What we can use is, is the young larvae, the neonate larvae. And if the young larvae or the neonate larvae can be killed, the rest of the stages are guaranteed they will be killed. So this is what now the most of the uh, the companies now take over in the United States like Tempera. They are using these most tolerant stage in their uh, treatments when they do in order to make sure that uh, their treatment is effective. Okay? So changing gears here, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the thermodynamic disruption. And plate disruption is a little bit of the introduction about plate disruption. Now this is mainly associated with the sex pheromone produced by the insects. May usually female produce it. It is a calling behavior, so she releases it. So the male follow the trail to identify the female for mating, and then the male to produce the egg for that eggs. But this is also considered as alternative for non critical technique. And how does the mating disruption works? So when you have a sex hormone produced by an insect, what we can do is synthetically, uh, artificially, we can produce that particular pheromone. And we can fog the environment or the purge the environment with very high concentration of pheromone. Usually, female makes very low concentration, so it is easy for the male to find her. But when you artificially purge the environment, there are clouds of lot of uh, pheromone in the environment. And what happens is, it masks the real pheromone released by the female. So the female cannot really actually find the uh, actual female because of the male senses become habituated with very high concentration of pheromone. So what happens is the males start to fly around and you know try to find where the pheromone is because it's all clouds of pheromone everywhere and he cannot find the male. So it's just spending a lot of time finding the false female because we have these false females come to the pheromone coming from artificial dispensers. So this phenomenon helps either the mating to be delayed or mating to be disrupted. So once the mating is delayed or disrupted or ultimately it is actually going to dwindle the population down. So that is the principle behind this. So we also call that as a male elimination technique or male elimination method. And with the similar thing, let's get on a semicolon, and I'm going to, uh, Ophelia has worked uh, extensively. This is the very first time uh, in a stone product insect to try with the beetle, because all the work in stone product is done with EA Dreamer and Zeta, and nothing has been done. So this beetle behaves like a moth, and it produces a set of pheromone called semicolon, and we wanted to test whether the mating disruption could be effective for this particular uh, beetle as well. So this work was carried out in, this is state of South Carolina in the United States. It was carried out in different cloud mills. There are houses, these mills, so I will just pick the pictures, show you these are different mills. We carried out all these experiments. And what we initially did is, we wanted to monitor the existing populations, uh, whether we can carry out the main disruption, because main disruption is ineffective population density is very high. So we use the regular trapping to find out, but some areas we have very high populations, heavy infested with the last year of a second, which is a similar table. Uh, but we monitor the populations with traps, and we also call this as a hoop station or only position cups. Basically what you do is you put a diet in a, a cup, plastic cup, and then let the female come lay eggs, and then take it to the lab and incubate it for one month and count the number of adults in the genome. So that's kind of the way how we actually evaluated the existing population. And then once we know the populations are relatively high, we actually carry out this main disruption, which is a very high density of pheromone, which was lower than the dispenser, and one dispenser is equal uh, enough for about the places we treated were really, really big. Uh, some of the warehouses belong to Starbucks coffee storage. Some of the flower mills, very big flower mills. Some of them are feed mills. So these are really big uh, areas. So we had to treat a lot of labor and a lot of work for that. 
So we actually put our dispensers. And you could see that immediately after that, there is a decline, right? In the peak population. And it happened in, you know, in the certain time also when we treated them with the very heavy infestation coming in subsequent year, immediate decline. So what it says is we monitor the population as before treatment and after treatment. So we have an idea of the insect in the before treatment and after treatment. So we counted the tracks and we show that there is a significant reduction with eight weeks before treatment and eight weeks after treatment. You could see that immediate track shutdown and this is for the trial one. And also we also wanted to know what is happening in short term rather than eight weeks and long term. And even in the short term, two weeks uh, before treatment and after treatment, you could see that there is significant reduction in the captures in the track, even though they are, because it is summarized by several of the uh, mills, uh, there are not variable to exist among them. And same scenario here, eight weeks before and after treatment, immediate shut, track shutdown. So what it says is basically, significant shutdown of track means that Maybe disruption taking place. It was validated with the data also emerged from the food station or the owing position cost, which also showed the same trend. And what is uh, uh, surprising for us is when you do the first trial, we captured about 200 gators. And the same person in the next year when we treated, the starting population has already decreased. It's about 100 gators now. So what it says is it's not a immediate effect like you are spraying a chemical and everything is dead, no. But it is a slow decline, it's going by slowly year by year and it is actually affecting the population but it is not a fast, a fast knockdown, okay. Um, so it's actually now the one of the company in the United States called Tracy, it has taken the advantage of uh, uh, registering this to, through the EPA, so one of the environmental protection agency and the EPA. So this uh, main disruption dispensers will be becoming available in the market very soon after registration because this is the very first time we did that and now uh, they have to be registered in the system. Okay, so uh, moving back to the next one is basically the mass trapping, which I want to talk a little bit about mass trapping, some of you are interested. But what I want to uh, highlight here is the some of the disadvantage of mass trapping. Because um, mass trapping is a good phenomenon, but it has a significant effect only if substantial dust can be removed. If it is a heavily infested facility in a mill or warehouse, and if you cannot capture almost uh, at least 99% of the population, it's not going to be very effective. And also, uh, if we are using an aggregation pheromone, which is very nice because the aggregation pheromone will attract both sexes, males and females. But if you are using a sex pheromone, we are going to only eliminate the males and the females are going to be remaining still and maybe successfully some of the female who be males can play eggs and continue the population. And uh, that is a very critical issue for the females cannot be trapped with the sex pheromone. And also in mass study, we need to deploy a very high number of traps, so it's very expensive. So what we wanted to do is, just to show you here, in case we have this kind of a population and to mass trapping, we can catch about 90% of the insects and can be removed, still 10% of the males escape and they can uh, mate with the female and then the population can be continued. So the new direction is whether the sex hormone can be incorporated with some kind of plant order based attractor, a plant attractor, so we can reinforce the attractiveness of the track, the same track, for males as well as the female. So instead of just trapping the male, so you can also bring in into the same track the females. So that was what the idea here to do into the uh, again for the Nasino Serifone, uh, with uh, any coast based attractor would be really helpful for them to uh, capture both uh, both sexes in the same track. So what we initially did is we screened lots of different products, about 70 different posts to see how they are responding to uh, the different, uh, these 
myelases, and I'm going to be as myelases. And you need to have some uh, force like beef, uh, corn, boulders, paprika, because uh, secret beetle is very attracted to spices. Say they are damaged uh, chili and coriander and all kind of different spices. So you also take all the different types of chili, paprika, brown pepper, of course, brown coffee is the best of coffee. All kinds of different oils. Can you imagine it's also <laughs> attracted to different types of oils? So we screen a lot of different insects here, and it, with this, we came up with the best cues, of course, which are they are responding for the subsequent experiment. And again, in relation of the time, I'm not going to present all the information, but what we did is the selected hosts were then extracted, and they were actually again done in the same camp area with a uh, uh, passing walk. Right? 
So there's a lot of problem in the America with the gender association against the using the surgical floor, right? And also, uh, it should not be fire toxic, uh, it should not be any unacceptable residues, and have, when you're treating a brain, it's a very large bit, and the fumigants should be able to penetrate because they're dropping it from the top, and it should penetrate all the way to the down because most insects may be surviving in the bottom. So the penetration of the fumigant is also important. So also, as uh, mentioned, in the United States, it's mostly used for water treatments, not very popular for insect control. And some of the potato farmers use a little bit, but it's not uh, very popular among the soil products, or it was not tested heavily. So, uh, what, we, uh, what is the advantage of using ozone? It is uh, very effective for microorganisms, but it is also actually has the potential to kill mycotoxins in grain if you use it, not only insects, but you can also kill the mycotoxic producing microorganisms. So that is the added advantage. So ozone is uh, also can be produced on site. It's not like a chemical company you have to buy this uh, fumigant and bring it and fumigate it, shut down the facility, everybody uh, had to go out. There is no need for that. And one of the other advantages is degrade the increase the food emits to oxygen, which is breathable. So it's not toxic. And it's also decomposition, it doesn't need any residues from the brain. And it is very safe for bystanders and it goes break down into oxygen. And in the United States, the Food and Drug Administration classifies this as generally recognized as safe, uh, safe as grass. And one of the precautions to produce ozone is just air, very cheap and inexhaustible, it's unlimited. So, uh, how does the ozone work? Because ozone is a very high oxidative gas. It can oxidize the, uh, it has a very high oxidative potential. So the insect has this uh, plasma membrane, it's a, the cell colony. So what it does is, it actually oxidizes the sulfur-containing proteins, which are present in the membrane, and then the uh, Krebs cycle, you may recall your biology, which happens in the mitochondria, which has double membranes. So all these membranes will be affected by the ozone, and the glycolysis process as well as the Krebs cycle process will be affected. Therefore, the ADP is not produced. There is no energy, so the insects are going to die ultimately. Again, it is not a quick knockdown effect. You cannot just like spray the paint and kill the insects. Ozone does not work that way. It takes time to kill it because it is. Uh, process, biochemical process, it depends on insects can use existing energy for a longer time before dying, right? So, what we want to test is, uh, we want to test whether the ozone is effective for an eternal feeder, like the one which is feeding inside of the brain, because it's hard to kill, because it's very protected by the brain itself. The cinephrosphorizase is our test organism. We also want to test whether the external or feeding from outside or damaged kernel can be killed. And we want to test different concentration and different exposure period in order to find out the best concentration and best uh, time to kill them. And also see when you expose the ozone in the seeds are exposed, whether it can affect the germination quality of these seeds, because some of these seeds were used by the farmers for uh, this crop germination. So, with that in mind, okay, I just want to show you this is a custom made ozone generator which is made by a company in Iowa, only made for us. We actually talked a lot back between the company and them to design this. So they were always teasing me saying that this is the only one that exists in the world. So <laughs> uh, not a problem, we have to always uh, troubleshoot. So what, sorry. What it does is it takes the air from the outside. 
basic. Uh, so first you want to test the internal data. What we did is uh, we put the PVC pipes to resemble the leak columns and we fill them in the different uh, way of the leak. And if we want to test all the different stages again. So we took adults, we took the damage color, which are basically the larvae and pupae larvae inside, pupae inside, and the eggs in uh, separately, we bury them in the different depths of representing that the insects are actually in the top, in the middle, in the bottom. Uh, because we want to see how far the ozone can penetrate through the gray mass. And then we expose them into different concentrations for different time period, 6 hours, 12 hours, 18 hours, uh, 24 hours, and so on. And that is the uh, uh, channel that they are being exposed. And I just want to show you some of the results here. So this is the results of the adult mortality. And uh, if you see that uh, brick red is basically the insects which were buried at the 5 centimeter. The yellow is basically the insects buried at the 15 centimeter. The light blue of aqua is basically the insects buried at the 25 centimeter. And right below then the orange, the green or the dark blue are yeah, the controls. Because Control is similar, but they are not exposed to the ozone treatment. And all this you want to see is in the big red uh, bars here. What he says is when we expose them to 6 hours, 12 hours, uh, 18 hours, or 24 hours, we can easily kill the insects on the top, 5 centimeters. But it is very hard to kill the ones in the 15 centimeter, and even harder to kill the one in the 25 centimeter. And if